I began to minister last week about the God who heals. I think I did a really, really good job at scaring everybody. which normally doesn't happen in a message about God heals, or the God who heals. But this is the point that I was making last week, and some of what I'm going to say this morning is a reiteration of last week. So I hope you don't mind that that word will increase in your heart and take root in your spirit, and that you'll eat the fruit of it. Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says that we are not ignorant. We are not, let me put it this way, let me put the positive spin on it. We know what the enemy is up to. We don't just hide our heads in the sand. We're not ignorant of his devices. We know how he operates. Divide and conquer. We know how he operates in discouragement. We know how he operates in deception. Scripture also says in John 10.10, Jesus reveals the activity of the enemy by giving him the title of the thief. It says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So anything that comes against your life or comes into your life that steals from you, whether that's physically, materially, emotionally, steals your health, steals your joy, steals your peace, steals your time it's an activity and it's a sign that the enemy is at work in your life he comes to steal he comes to kill God is the author and the creator of life so conversely whatever God has wanted to do and has done in the earth the enemy will seek to snuff it out seek to kill it whether it's physically, and, and the Lord gets so much blame in this area. You know, people pass away, and, uh, well, God just needed another flower for his garden. What a bunch of nonsense. God, <laughs> well, I'm, uh, you know, I could use a little more tulip over here. Poof, let me, take, let me kill somebody on earth. Come on. You know, it sounds great because, you know, they're likened, oh, he's a flower, and now he's in God's, you know, come on. Try to kill you physically, try to try to kill your dreams and your destiny, tries to kill your relationships. Thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. God is the creator. The enemy is the destroyer. Destroy your life. Destroy your health. Destroy relationships. Destroy marriage. Destroy destruction. We have to be careful of of those things uh, that are in our lives that, that glorify that. We have to glorify the Lord. We have to glorify his activity. We have to praise him. We have to partake in what he does and stay away from the others. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. We're not ignorant of how he operates. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And then 1 Peter 5, 8, he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And as I've said multiple times here, I'm glad for that verse. 
Because then it tells me that if he's seeking someone he can devour, it means that there are those that he cannot devour, and I want to be one of those people. I began talking last week at the, at the beginning of the message about the operation of the enemy in this current day and age that we are living in. Let me not even say day and age, but let me say this present hour. We look at the book of Revelation and we say, oh, this is the end times. End times. End times. And we always think, you know, they got it wrong in the 70s with the tribulation, uh, you know, movies and but everything going on with the Cold War and, you know, this could be the end of the world. This could be the end of the world. And every subsequent generation, you know, this could be the end. Bush got in, this could be the end. Clinton got in, this could be the end. Obama got in, this could be the end. Trump got in, this could be the end. Biden got in, this could be the end. The next one got in, this could be the end. We talked last week that no matter what went on in prior years, there is never more a time in history where things have pulled a little closer into what the book of Revelation talks about of what the end, end times would look like. And let, let me give you a, a, a frame of reference. The end times is not when you see all the uh, stuff in the book of Revelation start to take place. The end times, according to the Bible, actually began when Jesus ascended into heaven. The expectancy of the disciples and the early church was that at any moment Jesus could return. They didn't put off, well, you know, 2,000 years later will be the end time. Because of Jesus' teaching specifically, you don't know the hour and you don't know the day. But the point is, live ready. So the disciples and the early church lived ready this is why you see them in the book of acts that as the church grew it says they were devoting themselves to the apostles doctrine to the breaking of bread and to prayer and fellowship with one another that's why in the book of hebrews it says that at that that we should be gathering together all the more even as we see the day approaching the admonition of the early church is live ready. Jesus can come back at any moment. We are given some signifiers in the book of Revelation that talk about one world government, that talk about a uh, monetary system that's put into place. And one of the things, you know, and... and I have said it to the surprise of, of many people. When we talk about one world government, the scripture doesn't say one world government except for the United States of America. The United States of America will come under a one world government. Now, whether that happens sooner or later, let's pray it's later than sooner. We don't want to be those that say, well, let's just be it sooner. Let's get, get this thing over with as soon as possible. With the devastation and the destruction, you know, I've of, often wondered how in the world 
In a one world government, the, the one thing that you have to worry about is resistance and uprising from the citizens who don't want to be controlled, don't want to be manipulated, and don't want to be under a totalitarian rule. And what has been talk, talked about for decades is uh, how to control the mass of people. Because if you think about it, if you have, if you have three crazy cats, they're easier to control than 20 crazy cats. If you have three toddlers, <laughs> They're more easy to control than 20 toddlers. So there has to be a shrinking of the size of the population to be able to control the mass of people. And this has been all set up behind the scenes and sometimes not so behind the scenes. Years ago, there was a big... You know, in the, in the 70s, Roe versus Wade and that whole debacle of abortion being legalized. Abortion was legalized, so which would make the population less, which doesn't make any sense because if politicians are after our tax dollars, they're, they're cutting themselves in the end because there will be less people to tax. But they're not just out for the money. And then, in the 70s, and then I believe it was the early 90s, when it was put in the spotlight of Jack Kevorkian, Dr. Death, who was the big uh, news piece about doctor-assisted suicide and about the euthanasia of those who are either too old or their quality of life is not what somebody else thinks that they should be or have and so euthanasia so you've got one aspect of public policy that says let's kill the unborn and then another part of the policy that is enacted of let's legalize euthanasia at the end of life or at the end of the quality of life to be determined by somebody else. It's all to, to shrink the population size to have a smaller number to be able to control. And when we read in the book of Revelation we find that it says that in the end days there will be plagues and there will be pestilences. So in other terms, there will be sickness and there will be disease. And no matter how advanced medicine gets, there's one thing that medical science has not been able to stop, and that's death. And the other thing is Nowadays, with the whole giant of the pharmaceutical industry, now there are those doctors and nurses, so don't, don't get me wrong and don't quote me wrong. If you're going to quote me, quote me right. Not every doctor, not every nurse, not every person in healthcare has some hidden agenda. But those that are in, you know, even with this uh, coronavirus and the vaccine, uh-oh, we're getting flagged on Facebook now because <laughs> I said the two magic words, coronavirus and vaccine. There have been, now this is when did the vaccine come out or start to be worked on? Like even back in March of last year, you know, warp speed, let's get a little bit of this and let's get a little bit of that throw that together and get people with it there have been nine new 
millionaires created just based off of that vaccine production alone. Somebody is in it for the money. And of course, if you watch uh, any news channel for any, or let me just say television channel, for any length of time, you'll be bombarded with numerous uh, commercials and advertisements about medicine. That, you know, if you're not feeling so great today, take two of these, call me in the morning. You know, your migraine headache, take two of these, and then the side effects could cause high blood pressure, could cause a brain bleed, could cause death. Headache or a brain bleed or death. And sometimes the way that things go where people, they, they put people on medicine that cause all these other chaotic things in their, in their bodies that they have to be prescribed more medicines. You got to take a medicine to take care of the symptoms from the other medicine that you were taking to take care of something that was simple. Somebody is in it not just to help people out. And scripture says that in the last days, there will be sicknesses and diseases that will come. There's even been in the past 10 years, major uh, news outlets and magazines, news magazines that have front page on their cover talking about, you know, super, super diseases, super bugs. You know, the wave of the future is sickness and disease. And now even we hear about this coronavirus, it'll never be done away with. There'll just be different variants. There'll be just, you know, we had alpha. Now we have, you know, delta. We're going to get lambda, epsilon, all those other Greek letters. But the only thing that we need to be concerned about as believers is that we have the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm thankful for the Lord that He has given us a peak of the, of the end. And if He's given us a peak of the end, then it not, has not taken Him by surprise. And if He has given it to us for us to read, to understand, to become acquainted with, then that is to prepare us not just prepare us to be, you know, you know, like the bully that says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat you up, and then they beat you up, and then there's nothing you can do about it. You know, he doesn't forewarn us as if there's nothing we can do about it. And I began to read uh, last week in Exodus. So if you have your Bible, this is where our main... Our main thoughts are this morning trying to sum up what we talked about last week and get more into Exodus chapter 15. God knows the end from the beginning. God's ultimate plan, design, and desire was to have human beings in relationship with himself. He created man in his image, placed him in paradise, a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden. Now, he did that knowing that on September 25th, 6,000 B.C., that Adam and Eve were going to partake of the knowledge of the tree, the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, and that sin was going to enter into their existence and was going to mess everything up for everybody for a long time. God created them despite knowing what their choice and what their decision for themselves was going to be. 
God didn't say, let me create these people, and then now I'm going to make them do this, and I'm going to make them do that. I'm going to make them sin. So then I can get some kind of kick out of throwing them out of the Garden of Eden. You know, God's not sadistic and twisted. He's not a megalomaniac. He's not a narcissist like that. God created them, gave them everything they needed to live and to thrive in a perfect environment, even though he knew that they themselves were going to take what he had given them and make a mess of it. But he said, that's okay. They're going to make a mess of it. And this is, this is uh, Genesis 3.15. But at the right moment, I'm going to send a Savior. And this Savior is going to crush the head of Satan. Even though the serpent's going to bite, his, bite and bruise his heel, the head of Satan will be crushed underfoot. Even while man was disobeying, even while man was... God had a plan in his heart of love to say, as Romans so beautifully says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That even while Adam and Eve were in the middle of that bite of the fruit, God's heart of love was I'm going to restore them, I'm going to heal them, I'm going to bring them back to paradise. God's plan, God's design, God's desire, God's will for your life is always to bring you back, to bring goodness into your life, to bring provision into your life, to bring you back into a Garden of Eden experience of fellowship with Him and everything that the Garden of Eden looked like. Now, there's a thing in the world of theology that is understood. When we think about the presence of sin in the world, we think about the cross of Jesus Christ. We think about heaven. We think about things to come. And it has to do with a phrase that is often used, and it's the phrase, already, but not yet. Already, but not yet. Things have been decreed and enacted in the realm of the Spirit that we can get a foretaste of in the here and now because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and because of what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer now, we can get a foretaste of what the ultimate fulfillment and the ultimate culmination of God's plan is in the end. In Scripture, when we look at those references in the New Testament that talk about salvation, that talk about being saved, it's in conjunction with the understanding. And actually, if you read it in the original language, if you read it in the Greek, it says, be being saved. It says, being saved, and it says, be being filled. It is, it is something that has happened in history. We receive our salvation. We hear the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We respond with open heart. We declare our loyalty to Jesus Christ. We receive him as the forgiver of our sins, and, and we make him and place him as the king, as the Lord, as the master of our lives. That is the point that we receive salvation. But we are not fully saved 
until we're received into God's kingdom. When we either pass from this life, we go up in the rapture, because there are many scripture that talks about the, swift, the, the race is not given to the swift, but it's given to the one who endures to the end. Salvation is a fact in history, but the working it out is a process. And don't allow the enemy to, to bring a misunderstanding when, when Scripture says work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It's not like you're trying to barter with God. You're trying to beg, you know, I hope this thing is going to work. It is that what God has placed in you, let it be drawn out of you. Let it, be, let it work out of you. God drills a well of salvation in your life, and you have to work out. You have to draw out of that well of salvation. Just like you draw a well on your property, there's the presence of water. You have to, you know, it's great you have a well. It's great you have water underneath, but it's not going to do you any good. You're not going to live in the fullness of, of the reality of that water under surface until you draw what's in to the outside. Ultimate salvation is when we're in heaven. Ultimate salvation is when we're in heaven. Also, when we look in the New Testament and it talks about salvation, there's the Greek word that is used uh, with the connotation of not just a spiritual salvation, a spiritual relationship with God, but it also means our deliverance. Because really, when we receive the life of God into our lives, anything that is contrary to God's life, to God's person, he gives us power to overcome and to be free from. The Bible says that you can't serve two masters. The Bible says that, that, uh, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so he gives us the power to be delivered, to be set free from those things that would try to hang on in our lives that were a part of our lives that tried to bring destruction and death, tried to, tried to uh, keep us in the bondage to sin. We can experience freedom because of deliverance. And then there's also the aspect of the physical being, healing. So when you look at the Greek word in the New Testament that says salvation, I encourage you that when you come across that, you read the English word salvation, replace it with the word deliverance. Replace it with the word healing to help you get a fuller understanding of what is being talked about and what is being included in that one little word, salvation. You know, we have the word in English, love. But, but in Greek, there's multiple words for love, and it takes on different meanings. And so this is another instance where we have the Eng one English word that has a sphere of meaning. And the reason why it means what it means, salvation as in spiritual life and connection with God, what and it means deliverance and being free from the power of sin and the bondage to the enemy. And the reason why it means healing for our soul, 
Because we can say sticks and stones may, may, may break our bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie because you can get thrown in jail and charges pressed against you for verbal abuse. Words do hurt because God understands and the enemy understands life and death are in the power of the tongue. So God wants us to be whole in our soul. And he wants us to be whole in our body. God gives us a package deal because there are many facets and many av uh, aspects of who we are as human beings that have been affected by what was done in the Garden of Eden. What happened because of sin? There was a separation between God and man. Sin entered in, and dominion to Satan began to unravel and unfold to what that would look like. So God would bring in his sacrifice. God would bring in his means to restore that broken connection of relationship. So we are spirit. So God deals with that spiritual area that's been affected by sin. We have connection with God through the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus on the cross. Never before that moment of sin was there depression or anxiety or suspicion or jealousy or greed or anger. There was, there was no poverty. There was no hunger. There was no sickness. In the Garden of Eden, there was none of that because what God creates and produces is perfection. But because of man's opening the door to the enemy, everything not of perfection began to overtake and overrule because man, the deciding factor in the earth, submitted his will to someone other than who was rightful Lord. So man's choice, Adam and Eve's choice in the garden affected them spiritually in their relationship with God and affected their soul. Like I said, even at the beginning of the service, the Bible says that in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So in paradise, in Eden, there was no depression, there was no bitterness, there was no anger, there was no jealousy or envy. There was none of that. That's an aftermath, that's an after effect, that's the, that's the fruit of sin because of what happened in the garden. But Jesus provides, God provided through him, not only the means of our spiritual salvation, reconnection and relationship with God, but he provides for us healing and restoration of our soul. You think about Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Restores my soul to what? When you restore something, you bring it back to its original condition. You know, you restore an old automobile or you restore an old house. It's not, you know, you're not adding different features. You're restoring what was there beforehand. You're bringing out the natural beauty because of what over time had become damaged or tarnished, had become dull. And so through the blood of Jesus, God has polished our soul, polished out the scuffs, polished out the dullness, restores our soul back to what it should have been if there was no Garden of Eden and what took place in the fall of man. Death, weakness, and disease were never known until Adam and Eve submitted to the Lord of sickness 
disease, and death. There was no sickness in the Garden of Eden. But because sickness came, God said, if I'm going to do something, I do it in all perfection. Every area where the enemy came in and messed, messed it up, God comes in and brings restoration, brings it back to what it should have been, our relationship with him, the experience and the condition of our soul. And that's why divine healing of our physical bodies is a part of what Jesus did on the cross because the remedy of God is not going to allow the effect and the work of Satan to go unchecked. God didn't say, well, I'm real good in this area. I'll fix you up over here and I'll fix you up over there. But you're just going to, I'm just, I just got to leave you because my solution, my cure isn't perfect. I got to leave this going on. Everywhere that man was affected because of sin, God provides a remedy to. And as we go on in life and we understand that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices, that he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, and that he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, that the Bible prophesies that there will be pestilence, there will be diseases, there will be sicknesses, he doesn't leave us without remedy. He has provided for us healing in our relationship and healing in our covenant with him. The New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews, tells us that if we look at the Old Testament, and especially what took place with Moses delivering the children of Israel out of slavery to Egypt and the bondage to Pharaoh, that that is a picture. It's a type and it's a shadow. It's kind of a, a sneak peek of what God was going to do through Jesus. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus is likened to one like Moses. And even, even it's prophesied in the Old Testament, one like Moses will come and deliver his people. There's a great correlation between what happened at the Red Sea and what happened at the cross. Exodus 15, verse 22. It says that Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and a regulation... And there he tested them. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I put on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, am your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy date palms, and they camped there beside the water. Isn't it interesting that there was a tree and Moses took and threw the tree into the waters and the waters that were bitter were made sweet the picture of the children of Israel coming out of bondage of slavery to Egypt is a picture of our covenant with God, of our relationship with God, of the salvation that he provides. Jesus is our Moses. 
He brings us out of captivity to the bondage of sin and Satan. Here we find that Moses, that the children of Israel come upon waters. They're thirsty. They desire something to drink. And yet, what is provided for them in the world is undrinkable. It's bitter. We can go to all the things of the world and we can try to find the satisfaction of the thirsting of our soul. But when we take a drink of it, it only brings bitterness. It only brings negativity. It only brings something to us that we would think, well, that wasn't a good idea, was it? The world has a lot to offer, but it's not going to satisfy the thirsting of the soul. People grumbled at Moses, what are we going to drink then? Moses cried out to the Lord, there was a tree. He said, cut the tree down, throw it into the waters. The waters were made sweet. The bitter waters of life that you have tasted, God wants to bring a sweetness to as we allow the power of the tree that Jesus hung on to come in contact with our lives. The waters were bitter. The natural condition of the environment was not conducive to life, was not conducive to satisfaction. In our living, our natural life, nothing in this world is going to be conducive to our betterment. Things in this world, like I said, we go to the pool of medicine and I'm not saying don't see a doctor. I'm not saying don't go to the ER. I'm not saying don't take medicine. But so many go to the pool of medicine and then like the scenario we played out earlier, you've got to take five different medications for the five different symptoms that came from taking the one medication. They've, they've, they've the world holds out hope for a solution, but there is no real final solution. But God, when he gets to be a part, he provides a solution. And we as believers, we have to realize that right now, we are a people who live in that realm of already but not yet. We're a part of God's kingdom, but not fully like we will be. We have an experience in this life and in this world. We are not transcendent beings where things of this world we just you know float seven inches above the ground I mean some people act like it and pretend like it <laughs> but our focus needs to be on the Lord Moses didn't, didn't, the people tasted the water. They complained and murmured to Moses. Moses didn't just say, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We just got to keep moving. He didn't just sit down on the ground and throw a, a, a tantrum like they did. He inquired of the Lord. 
As people of the kingdom of God, we have to inquire of our authority. God brought them out of Egypt, not so they could die in the wilderness, but so they could discover who he was. Remember, the children of Israel didn't have a Bible to refer to. They were living the Bible. God revealed himself in supernatural ways. And God said, look, I know you're not familiar with me. I know you've heard hearsay stories passed down about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But let me show you personally who I am. Right? Remember, God's, or Moses said to God, you know, who am I going to say sent me? I am that I am. Not the I was, not the I will be, not just the wait and see. But the I am. Present tense. Current. That's why the book of Hebrews says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What was true back then is true for today. The names might change, the geographical locations might change, the scenarios of modern life may be very different than ancient Israel living. But our God is still the same. Time passes on, the world changes, the experience of humanity changes, but God remains the same. He's as much now as he was then. He's as much blank now as he was then. We're given the scripture so we can go back and refer to how God is, who God is, so we can understand if he did it back then, he's able to do it right now in my life. If he did it for one... He'll do it for all. The testimonies of the miraculous in the ministry of Jesus, yes, tell us how wonderful who Jesus was, but not just who Jesus was, but who Jesus is. What happens when you hear a testimony in church that God did this in my life, God did that in my life? You get a boost of encouragement in your spirit that if God did that for them, then he can do that for me. Well, what do you think the the accounts in the Gospels are? There's somebody's testimony, somebody's story of what Jesus did in their life. So we go back to what Jesus did in the Gospels. We go back to how God dealt with his people in the Old Testament to know how God's going to act and what God can do and what God wants to do in our lives today because he doesn't change. What he did for one, he'll do for all. God said, tell them I am that I am. He revealed himself by his name. The one who is the one who's self-sufficient, the one who doesn't need anybody else, the one who is present tense in every situation, every circumstance, not just present, but present tense with what you need. If you need deliverance, he's your deliverer. If you need salvation, he's your savior. If you need healing in your body, he is your healer. He revealed himself to his people by the name that he chose to reveal himself. I am that I am. And we, that was before the Red Sea. That was, tell my people the I am that I am is getting them out of here. They followed. Not without supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles, and judgments against Egypt. They get to 
an experience that they've never experienced before. They get to troubled waters. They get to bitter waters. God says, take a tree, throw it in the waters. And he says, for I, the Lord, am your healer. For I, the Lord, am Jehovah Rapha. God reveals who he is, not just who he was, not just who he is going to be, not just who we hope he is, but he reveals himself by the names that he particularly chooses to identify himself by. I am that I am. I am. I am God, Jehovah, there is none beside me. And then secondly, after they get out of bondage to Egypt, God reveals to them that he is their healer. Now remember, we said that the New Testament tells us as New Testament believers that the Old Testament was written for our benefit so we could receive instruction, so we could bring, uh, receive encouragement and revelation. Remember, the book of Hebrews says that what happened with the children of Israel coming out of Egypt was a type and a shadow, was a foreshadow of a foretaste of something that was pointing to something that was going to come in the future. And that thing that was going to come in the future was Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why all along in Israel's journey and in Israel's history, you find continual references and prophecies and types and shadows of what is revealed, of what is to come through Jesus Christ. Take example, the tabernacle. We've, years gone by, we've done big studies on the tabernacle and the symbolism of each of the, you know, the, the materials it was made out of, the sacrifices and what each of those sacrifices stood for, the garments of the priests and how each uh, detail of the garment of the priest was symbolic of something, everything about Israel points to Jesus and what he would do. God revealed to his people that he was their savior, that he was their deliverer. He was bringing them out of bondage. Physically in the natural. So then we could see that that is a foreshadow of what Jesus would come to do, that he is our savior, that he will bring us out. He's our deliverer. He will set us free from bondage and slavery to sin and to Satan. The next way, not long after the Red Sea dust was still on their feet, only a few days journey into this thing, they come upon bitter waters. God says, throw a tree. Made the water sweet. Why did I make the water sweet? So I could reveal to you who I am. I am your healer. I am the source of your physical life. And not just the source, the creator, the initiator, that spark of life that happens in the womb. But I will sustain your life. I will sustain your physical being. I'm not just your creator, the one who knits you in your mother's womb, but I am the one who can heal you. When sickness and disease comes your way, We don't always have a pleasant, sweet experience physically. The enemy comes and attacks us in different ways, by different means. 
But the Lord saw the attack of the enemy, and he brings a cure. He brings a resolution. He brings a solution. He is our healer. Where the enemy would seek to destroy, where the enemy would seek to kill, where the enemy seeks to bring sickness and disease, God is our healer. Even doctors will tell you, and we love doctors. I don't know how many times I have to say it in a message so nobody gets confused and misquotes me. I appreciate doctors. I love doctors. I respect what they do. But even doctors will tell you that they are not the healer. They facilitate healing, but they are not the healer. Even doctors, whether they like it or not, have to give a nod that, albeit some have a narcissistic mentality and, you know, a little God syndrome, but by and large, they say that there is something beyond our understanding. We're just facilitators. We just bring what's here in this earth and apply it to the situation and try to bring some help. They help facilitate. They are not the healer. They help facilitate the body's natural healing. Man's natural condition is to need something outside himself. We need a savior. It doesn't come from within ourselves. It comes from without of ourselves, outside ourselves. We need a healer. It doesn't come from within ourselves. It comes from the one who is our healer. God re reveals himself as a healer to his people, and he does it in close connection with throwing a tree. Could have done anything. Moses, that same, that same staff that you held up over the Red Sea, that parted the Red Sea, hold it up over the waters. He didn't say that. He said, take a tree and cast it into the waters. Whenever the tree is symbolic, a pole is symbolic, used in Scripture, you can always look to the cross even chapters later where the children of Israel are again attacked by vipers and serpents, God says, fashion a serpent made of bronze, hold it up on a pole, and whoever looks to that will be healed. God's design and desire is always to bring healing. Not, well, I hope you learn something from it. You shouldn't have been saying that, going there, doing this, so I hope you learned something from it. The thing that he wants us to learn is that he wants us to be whole. He wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be strong because how can we perform his will and do his will and do his work? And Jesus said, if I be lifted up above all the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Our natural condition is to need something outside of ourselves. The world will provide plenty of opportunity for us to try to meet that need. It'll only turn to bitterness. But when we go to the one who has the cure, the one who is the source, the one who is the author of our salvation, when we go to him, his Solution is perfect. The Lord showed him a tree that was symbolic of the tree that would come through Jesus Christ. God was saying, look, you've experienced bitter waters in this life, a bitter physical experience, a tree is going to bring your answer of healing, wholeness, and restoration. 
He was pointing to the future. He was pointing to what Jesus would do. We find in 1 Peter 2.24, the Apostle Peter writes, By his stripes we have been healed. Everything about Jesus' passion, those last couple days and hours of his life that he suffered so tremendously, It wasn't because of him. It was because not even the evilness of the heart of the government, but it was because of the scripture that says, while we were yet sinners, while we were under the dominion of sin and everything that sin brings, sickness, disease, poverty, struggle, depression, anger, jealousy, envy, all those types of things. While we were yet sinners, he brings a solution. He knew our condition. He knew how we were affected, not just in one area, but in every area and more than we can fathom of our experience. We were affected in every area as sin entered in and marred the image of what God had created in the garden. But God said, I'm going to have the last laugh. They may have come to a bitter experience. God provided healing. God provided wholeness. God provided restoration. And even beyond what he provided for them, he revealed himself and who he was in his character and nature, that he was healer. He was healer. We you bow your heads this morning? I want to give you an opportunity right where you are. You've gone through life You didn't plan it that way. But bitter experiences came into your life that you were forced to drink. And that bitter experience that you were forced to drink got way down on the inside of you. Perhaps you were going along in your life full of zest and full of health and then all of a sudden out of left field some attack of the enemy came against you your physical body and some type of illness some type of disease even if it was what they call hereditary it may be a fact on your father's side it may be a fact on your mother's side but the truth is God didn't design it or desire it for you it's an effect of what happened and he wants to reveal himself to you today as your healer healer of your soul from the bumps the bruises the scuffs the scrapes that you've experienced in life he wants to reveal himself as healer of your body because everywhere the enemy brought destruction and chaos God brought a perfect solution that includes our physical experience that includes our emotional experience that includes our mental experience that includes our spiritual experience and our relationship with God God never leaves us without a solution. Where the enemy has come in, the Bible says, that the Holy Spirit, like a flood, raises up a standard 
against it. God told Moses, cut down the tree and cast it in the midst of the waters. Revealed himself as healer. They were able to drink. They were satisfied. They moved on to a better place. You today, whether it's emotional, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, you can experience a healing through the cross of Jesus Christ. And you can go on to a better experience. It's a lie from the devil to tell you that this attack is a dead stop in your life. That this is all that there is for you. Nothing will change. Nothing can change. You just better learn to accept it. People who received a miracle in the Bible are people who refuse to believe that this is the way it had to stay. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the Spirit, we have cut down that tree. We have exalted the work of Jesus Christ and the cross and his blood. And I ask now that by faith, Lord, we cast that work. We release that power. We, we send that tree into bitter waters, into troubled experiences that have brought torment to the soul and brokenness to the mind that has affected the, the physical experience of the body. And we command bitter waters to be made sweet today, right now, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for turning bitter waters into sweet. We thank you, Lord, that instead of a lot being given to us of mumbling and complaining, about our experience of what we've been brought to, what has been brought to us. Lord, that you will do something miraculous. You will do something supernatural. That we will be better for it. That you will deliver us up out of it. That you will bring healing to us. And that, we will, that our mouths will be filled with thanksgiving and praise. And that we will move beyond. Beyond. What the enemy lied and said, this is all, this is your, you better just give up. This is it. You'll never be free. You'll never be healed. You'll never be the same. What they did ruined your life. You're messed up forever. Lord, I thank you that even as the children of Israel, even though you healed the waters, they drank and they were satisfied. Lord, we read the next following verses. They moved on to a place of 12 palm trees. And Father, you want to bring us to a place of perfection and healing and sustenance. You don't want us to camp down in bitter waters or even just shout about a miracle testimony. You want us to move on and go on past those things. Father, I thank you that some of those physical problems that we have dealt with, that we are going beyond those things in the name of Jesus. You're bringing a miracle of healing into our physical body. You're bringing a miracle of healing to our soul the things that have come against us situations, scenarios of life people, what they've said, what they've done we may not have asked for it sometimes maybe we did doesn't matter all that matters is that we look to you and we're looking to you now we thank you Father that the power and the work of the cross, the tree that Jesus hung on is being cast into the middle of our sickness, disease, in the middle of our bitter waters, our bitter experience of life. And you're bringing sweetness, you're bringing wholeness, you're bringing he healing, because you are revealing to us that you are the Lord, our healer. Father, I thank you for your people today. I thank you that we have received new strength in our spirit that you've given us a keenness in our eyesight to be able to identify 
what the enemy is trying to bring against us. And then you made provision for us to have wisdom on what to do. You've given us power in our will to make a decision and a choice to align ourselves with what you want for us and not what the enemy is trying to bring against us. Father, we thank you that we will ever look to you because if the solution was the cross back then, the solution is always, or the cross is always the solution to today. Lord, we thank you for the cross, that it not only provides spiritual salvation, but it also provides physical salvation in the manifestation and in the form of physical healing, that it brings salvation to our soul, a deliverance to our soul, a healing to our soul. You are our healer. We love you today. We thank you. Father, I pray those that are taking medication, Father, that number one, you will have worked a miracle in their body. Number two, that you would give them wisdom and that you would bring healing to them. That they will be able, they've got 10 pills they're on, that because of what you have done and what you're doing actively in them, they can go to nine, then they can go to eight, then they can go to seven, and one after the other can be crossed off. And they can have not just one testimony, but they can have ten testimonies of where you brought them from. So, Lord, I thank you that from this day forward, healing is going to be an active operating force in their life. We live in these last days where it's prophesied that sickness and disease will be all around. But I thank you that you never change, that you are a healer. Not only will you heal us when we get attacked, we have those physical symptoms, but Father, you will preserve us and keep us just like the children of Israel when the frogs and the gnats and the cattle and the hail were pummeling and pounding on the Egyptians, the children of Israel were safe and sound. Lord, I thank you that this is the day, this is the hour that you will cause a supernatural difference to be seen on the lives of your people versus those who are not your people. That it might happen to them, but it's not going to happen to us. It might have happened to our Egyptian neighbor or maybe even to our Egyptian family member. <laughs> but it doesn't happen, have to happen to us because we actively look to Christ as our preserver and our keeper and our healer. Lord, I thank you for your people protecting, preserving, and keeping. In Jesus' name, amen.